On behalf of Boulder Community Health, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Nathan Susnow. Dr. Susnow is a board certified and fellowship trained gastroenterologist. Dr. Susnow has been practicing in the greater Boulder, Denver area since 2014. He sees patients at Gastroenterology of the Rockies in Boulder, Lafayette, and Longmont. Welcome, Dr. Susnow. Thanks, Karen. Uh, I'm happy to talk to everybody who's uh, here today uh, about colon cancer. And uh, there's a few things that I'm hoping we can address today. So uh, one is, what is colon cancer? How does it develop? Uh, two is, how can we detect uh, colon cancer and or prevent colon cancer? And you'll see that there's different tests that can be used depending on somebody's preferences uh, and how they work. Uh, and then we'll address some high-risk groups. I just put a little bit about my history here. Uh, I uh, went to college in Rice University and majored in uh, chemistry. Uh, subsequently went to medical school at UT Southwestern in Dallas uh, with a focus on GI research and I, I looked into the um, kind of cancer pathway uh, that develops in esophageal cancer uh, from Barrett's esophagus. And then subsequently came out to Colorado and like many people loved it uh, back in 2004 to 2007. Uh, did an elective uh, with a worldwide cancer uh, expert, Dennis Onan, uh, researching uh, the effect of NSAIDs, which is ibuprofen, Aleve, uh, Advil, and aspirin on uh, colon cancer development. Uh, there's some evidence that they may be uh, preventative, at least low-dose aspirin in certain populations. Uh, and then did a GI fellowship at the University of Washington uh, with a combination of research in uh, cancer development at the cellular level. Adenocarcinoma is the type of cancer that many GI cancers are, including colon cancer and, and pancreatic, uh, and then some additional research into hepatitis C. And then I subsequently did an additional year uh, uh, with liver transplant work at Northwestern in Chicago. <clears throat> so March is colon, uh, colon and Rectal Cancer Awareness Month, and I think that's why we do this uh, lecture in March uh, most years. Uh, and in 2000, uh, President Bill Clinton officially dedicated March as National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, and then in 2019, uh, Governor Polis uh, actually also signed a proclamation declaring March uh, to be Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month in the state of Colorado. Uh, here's a, a kind of the proclamation from uh, Jared Polis. And then the Capitol building has uh, generally been lit up in, uh, in blue, uh, or the Denver City and County building, sorry, uh, every year. Uh, for Colon Cancer Awareness Month, and then uh, additionally Empower Field uh, and Ball Arena are often lit up for colon cancer awareness. Uh, colon cancer is common, so uh, this is not a cancer that you hear about rarely if you talk to your friends and family, um, and many of you probably have. Uh, somebody will know somebody who had colon cancer or have been personally affected by it. Uh, there's a few people I have up on the slide here, uh, many of which or most of which you may have heard, what, heard of. Um, Chadwick Boseman was probably the most recent uh, kind of famous person to have colon cancer at a very young age, uh, and a few other folks here. So it, it's something that we see in the news regularly um, with celebrities and other well-known uh, people. So kind of moving into the, the meat of the presentation, we're going to talk about colon cancer, you know, how it develops, uh, and then important things to keep in mind is, is it's common, as we discussed, it is lethal. Uh, and it is actually preventable in most cases. Uh, so looking at kind of a diagram of a, a person here, and you can see the colon outlined, which is, is this foreground image, and then the small bowel or the small intestine is, is pictured behind it. Uh, and the colon's uh, about four to five feet long, and it has a few major segments, as you can see here in the diagram. The top is the cecum, and then we progress to the ascending colon, since it's going up on the right side over through the transverse colon, down the descending on the left side, through this twisty area called the sigmoid colon, and then out into the rectum, and then your poop comes out. So that's kind of how we work uh, naturally. Uh, and there's a lot of symptoms and signs that can be concerning in the GI tract that are often worth talking to your primary care doctor or a gastroenterologist about. And, and these include things uh, such as changes in your bowel habits, blood in the stool, um, change to the shape or character of your stool, unexplained weight loss, um, challenges with abdominal pain, 
Anemia that's developed and is new without an obvious source. Anemia is a low blood count that can um, sometimes present with fatigue or just be picked up on your regular uh, yearly labs. Uh, and when we do uh, colonoscopy, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, we basically can put a scope into the colon and, and take a look at the entire colon. And we can look for colon cancer. Uh, and then additionally, we can look for little precancerous pieces of tissue, um, which are called uh, uh, polyps. And looking at that tissue, often we have an idea of whether it's something that's concerning or not. Um, and often we'll remove polyps uh, because we think most colon cancers come from polyps, and by removing them, we can prevent uh, colon cancer. I've put a few pictures in here. These are a few pictures of uh, the first one here is a colon cancer uh, on the wall of the colon, and then over here is a, a polyp, uh, and then here is another polyp, different type, uh, and then here's kind of a large polyp that may have cancer in it. Uh, so these are all things that we can encounter in the colon. Uh, this is uh, the sequence that we kind of think about uh, in research and that we think is, is how cancer develops. And so what you start with is kind of a little tiny bump on the wall of the colon. So this, this diagram is, is representing the colon wall, and we're seeing the inner lining called the mucosa, and then the submucosa, and then the serosa below that. With colonoscopy, we're mostly working within the mucosa, which is also where colon cancer will start and develop. And so you can see a little bump of cells, and then it starts becoming a small polyp, and then subsequently into a large adenomatous polyp, which is generally the precancerous type of polyp. And then subsequently, part of that polyp may develop cancer within it, which can then spread. And you can see in this little white area of cancer spreading into the lower tissue, into deeper tissue. And then this would kind of be cancer that has an advanced to be a true cancer, and we call it in situ. And then subsequently, a, a true cancer, which can no longer be removed with a colonoscopy, but requires surgery and may require chemotherapy um, or radiation or other things. Uh, and this, this progression from kind of small polyp to cancer uh, takes on average around 10 years. Uh, and so that's why for screening colonoscopies, generally the interval for somebody who's low risk and, and had an unremarkable colonoscopy is about 10 years because we're thinking we got a good look, we didn't see anything, it would be 10 years before you're able to progress to anything significant once you've even developed some of these small polyps. Uh, and then notably, as it says on the bottom of the slide here, most uh, polyps or adenomas do not become precancerous. Uh, but almost all colon cancers, 95% plus, will develop from adenomas. So as gastroenterologists doing a colonoscopy, we remove all the polyps. We don't know how to tell which one's going to progress, which one's not. And we remove all of them, and then we kind of hope we're getting the ones that, given enough time, might be able to progress to a colon cancer. Uh, so looking here, here's a few more pictures of different types of polyps. We can see this is a small hyperplastic polyp, which often are not precancerous. Uh, here's a pedunculated polyp. It has a little stalk. Uh, this is a spreading polyp, which can be a little bit more challenging to remove. And then here's a large polyp, and you can see in the background it gets kind of bigger and beefier back there, and that may have cancer or what's called high-grade dysplasia within it, which we treat very similarly to a, to a cancer, except that generally we can remove these with the colonoscope. And then here's a large polyp with a different type of imaging we sometimes use to highlight that type of tissue called narrowband imaging. Uh, here's a couple more pictures of subtle polyps that we pick up more often nowadays. Um, colonoscopes have improved quite a bit. We use high-def scopes, and so they can really highlight these subtle changes in the tissue uh, that were hard to see 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and now in the last 5 and 10 years, um, you know, textbooks have been written about this, and we get a lot of training. Here's a really subtle one here that is quite hard to see on the screen, but um, is just kind of a flat, raised area there that is a precancerous polyp or an adenoma. Uh, and then here's a couple more pictures of colon cancers. So you can see quite a bit different from uh, the other photos I showed. This is not removable with a colonoscope. In one case, on the right, it's, it's kind of nearly obstructing the colon lumen, so it's kind of gone in a big circle there and growing inward. Uh, and then on the other one here, it's just on the side, probably taking up about half the circumference. And, and these, if I tried to remove this with the scope, the problem is, is that it would have grown into those deeper tissues and we wouldn't be able to be successful, uh, in most cases at least. 
Uh, looking at, at cases of colon cancer in the United States, uh, this is a common cancer. So globally, it's the second most common cancer in women and the third most common in men. Uh, and it's the fourth leading cause of cancer overall. Uh, there's about 150,000 Americans that are diagnosed with colon cancer each year. Uh, and about 50,000 Americans will die from colon cancer, uh, which is about 8% of colon cancer deaths. Uh, what's important is most cancer screening that we do, um, if you think about prostate, breast, lung, when it's appropriate, uh, we're really looking for the cancer, and then we're trying to treat and remove the cancer hopefully early so that we can cure it. Uh, with colon cancer, we're really lucky because it comes from these polyps that are removable, it's preventable in many situations. So by going in with a colonoscope, removing polyps, uh, we can prevent them from turning into cancer uh, down the road. And you can see here, obviously, Colorado has its, you know, similar representation in terms of cases for the population. So the, this is a slide kind of showing the good news and the bad news in terms of colon cancer uh, in the last 40 or so years. Uh, colon cancer has decreased overall about 40% since 1987 in patients over the age of 50. Uh, and that's really been with the advent of screening colonoscopy and other screening modalities have, to some extent, reduced mortality from colon cancer. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen an increase in cancer in those that are uh, uh, younger patients under the age of 50, in particular in an age group that's in 45 to 50. Uh, and that was a big reason for the push to change the screening age in the last few years that you may have heard about or not uh, from 50 down to 45. And so now we recommend average risk colon cancer screening. So somebody who's feeling great, doing great, no problems, no history in their family of colon cancer, that you get screened through some modality starting at age 45. And that's documented here with this significant upswing, about 51% since 1994. Now these numbers are small, but this, this chart on the right is ages 20 to 49. And most of these cancers are in that 45 and over group. Uh, it's thought that this uptick or rise in, in colon cancer in the young is likely uh, related to diet changes and increased amounts of um, ultra-processed foods, uh, and then additionally, a more sedentary lifestyle and increasing rates of obesity. So if we look at some risk factors for colon cancer, uh, there's a number of them. Um, so different cancers have different risk factors. It doesn't always mean you will get the disease. And a lot of things, you know, all things in moderation, right? Eating cupcakes isn't good for you, but they're tasty, and occasionally it's probably nothing wrong with it. Uh, so with colon cancer, country of origin has an impact that may be more diet and genetic related than something within the country itself. Uh, and then other demographics, age, as we just discussed. Um, Interestingly, males and females have a little bit of a different risk for colon cancer year to year. Men are a little bit higher risk for colon cancer um, if you look at any single age group. But women live a little bit longer, and it's just long enough that they have about the same lifetime risk for colon cancer as men. Uh, and then race and ethnicity can be a risk. Uh, we used to see much higher rates of colon cancer in the African American population. Uh, to some extent, other populations have caught up with this increasing rate of colon cancer in the young. Um, socioeconomic status, which may be partially diet related, and then obviously family history is a big factor uh, for colon cancer. If we look at uh, family history and lifetime risk for colon cancer, what you can see here in, in this chart is, is showing FDR's first degree relative. So lifetime risk overall about 5% for most of us, uh, but as you have relatives affected, your risk starts to go up. It's about two-fold risk, so double that in somebody who has a first-degree relative with colon cancer. A first-degree relative over 50 goes up to about a four-fold risk. Two first-degree relatives, somewhere in three to four, and then greater than two first-degree relatives, or a syndrome we'll talk about in a minute called Lynch syndrome, which is a genetic syndrome, the risk really starts to go up quite a bit. And so these are groups that we really want to catch, and it's important as much as possible to, to understand and know your family history. Uh, if you're able to, and if you're adopted, talk to your doctor about whether screening is indicated and what might be best for you. And so this kind of just shows, you know, screening intensity. As your risk goes up, we're going to look more frequently with colonoscopy. For high-risk groups, colonoscopy is really the only screening test that's recommended because of that increased risk. Um, with Lynch syndrome in particular, we end up doing colonoscopies every one to two years in these patients uh, because we know that if we can detect polyps and remove them, 
early, we can prevent them from turning into cancer, and, and that population in particular advances quite quickly from polyps uh, to colon cancer. <clears throat> so looking at some of these other factors, um, you know, importantly, as we just discussed, some of the demographic factors, lifestyle factors. So smoking is not just a risk for lung cancer and heart disease. It's a risk for uh, colon cancer also. Uh, physical activity helps to reduce that risk. Uh, significant alcohol intake can be harmful. Uh, you know, we used to say that there probably was some healthy amount of alcohol. Red wine maybe is good for you. That data has really um, kind of gone away in the last couple of years. Uh, some alcohol is probably safe. Uh, but there is no healthy amount of alcohol anymore. So recognize that it's not really doing you any favors, but if you want to enjoy a drink occasionally, there's nothing wrong with that. A couple things in the diet um, group that are uh, always interesting to note, you know, number one, a diet that's high in red or processed meat. Uh, in Boulder, I often get a lot of questions about, well, I eat, you know, a friend has a, a farm and these are grass-fed cattle and, and well taken care of and they're different than the kind of industrial farming cattle. I haven't seen any studies that have looked at the differences between those groups. So um, all I can say is red meat is red meat, and my mom won't want to hear it, but pork is on that list too. Uh, and so avoiding red meat or limiting red meat can lower your risk for colon cancer. Uh, fiber will reduce your risk, so a good high fiber diet. Uh, low fruits and vegetables, so if you're not getting a lot of fruits and vegetables, a little bit higher risk for colon cancer. Um, one that is generally specific to the GI tract is this charred, broiled, grilled foods. So foods that are really cooked at a high temperature, have a nice char on them, uh, do seem to increase the risk for colon cancer a bit. Uh, and then ultra-processed foods, which generally is, is foods at the store that have chemical ingredients that you don't have in your house. Uh, these have been associated with increased risk of colon cancer too. And again, all things in moderation, I think it's very hard to be perfect here, but recognizing what things you can do for your health I think is always good. And then the last one, uh, very important, failure to get screened. So probably one of the biggest risk factors for colon cancer is not having any type of screening after the age of 45. <clears throat> and again, just uh, looking at this, you know, deaths from colon cancer, uh, it is a lethal disease. 606,000 deaths in the United States, 8,000 in Colorado. Uh, so here's, here's kind of another picture, another diagram looking at how colon cancer develops. Uh, and, you know, as we talked about, when you have a polyp, it has not grown into this deeper tissue. Once you have a colon cancer, it's grown into these deeper tissues. It can no longer be removed uh, with a colonoscopy, um, but still can be taken out surgically generally. And then as cancers progress, the stage two cancer is spreading deeper into the wall and it may be getting over towards the lymph nodes. Stage three has gone all the way through the wall of the colon and is involving lymph nodes. And then stage four means that it is spread to other organs such as the liver, uh, which is generally the, the most advanced type of cancer. Our effectiveness at treating these decreases as cancers become more advanced. Uh, so in general, a metastasized colon cancer that has gone to other organs has a, has a five-year survival less than 5%. I will say the oncologists have improved a lot in the last few years, and they do have better chemotherapy and medications than they used to. Um, but generally for... All of us, I would say, we would want to avoid this if possible. <clears throat> and here's just kind of a five-year survival rate of the different stages of cancer. So obviously we do pretty well in the early stages and then the outcomes go down as we get to more advanced cancers. So early detection really is critical here. Ideally prevention, but at least finding cancers in an early stage leads to much better outcomes. <clears throat> So in terms of things we can do, again, we can always have an impact on our lifestyle and we can have an impact on diet. Uh, in terms of cancer progression, so um, we know that being overweight and not being physically active, uh, both have been linked to colon cancer risk. Uh, you know, as we talked about diets high in red meats, including beef, pork, lamb, uh, and liver, if you like liver, uh, and processed foods, so hot dogs uh, and lunch meats can all raise colon cancer risk. Uh, generally, the best diet for this would be a Mediterranean diet. Plant-based diets can also be uh, beneficial in terms of colon cancer risk. A history of smoking and ongoing smoking increases your risk for colon cancer significantly, um, and it does start to drop after you quit smoking, and so it really has an impact even if you're somebody who smoked for 30 years uh, or longer. Uh, and then alcohol in general 
the, the recommendation for men and women is for men less than two drinks a day and for women less than one drink a day. And I think just recognizing that this is a treat um, and there isn't an amount that's going to be good for you. There is a protective factor. We talked about that I did some research in this um, when I was younger. Uh, but low-dose aspirin in some groups that are high risk uh, for colon cancer and also have an elevated risk for cardiovascular disease uh, can reduce the risk to get polyps uh, and colon cancer. That's uh, balanced with the side effects and risks of aspirin, which is an increased risk of bleeding, um, potentially stomach ulcers, uh, and strokes. And so it's not something we recommend to the general public, but in certain groups it can be beneficial depending on risk factors. Uh, and this is something to talk to your doctor about potentially. And then screening. Uh, so uh, kind of looking at, you know, again, how we progress from this normal tissue to a small polyp there that is really not even visible and then a visible small polyp, a larger polyp, and then a cancer where it's changed and it's now invading the, uh, into those deeper tissues. We'll look at ways that we have to detect colon cancer and detect polyps. And ideally, we want to find things as early as possible. So there are stool tests um, which allow early detection primarily of colon cancer. They do find some of these large polyps. Uh, and then there is uh, prevent prevention, which generally is colonoscopy with polypectomy. So going in with a scope and taking the polyps out before they advance to these, um, to cancer or, or even advanced polyps, which are a little bit more complex to remove. Uh, so number one, here we have a stool-based test that's showing up there called a FIT test. Um, these are tests that used to be called FOBT, now they're FIT, fecal immunochemical testing, and they look for blood in the stool and your doctor may order this or, or do this um, occasionally. Additionally, there's another test um, that we're using now called Cologuard, uh, which looks for both blood in the stool and cancer cells. So because those cancers will let kind of shed cells just like our skin does, Cologuard can detect either or either and, I guess, the cancer DNA and blood in the stool. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it. It does not differentiate between those in terms of the result you get back. You just get a positive or a negative. Uh, and if any of these stool tests come back positive, so either the FIT or the Cologuard, you have to follow through and have a colonoscopy. If you don't have a colonoscopy, you shouldn't have done the test in the first place because you had a positive test and you didn't go do the test you needed to do to figure out what's going on. Uh, so it's a two-step test, basically. Um, and then additionally, uh, testing for blood can, in some cases, detect other things. So often it's positive and we don't know why. We do a colonoscopy, we don't see, but certainly it can be positive from things like hemorrhoids, ulcers, uh, bleeding lesions that can occur in the colon that are not precancerous or cancerous. Uh, and so generally, the main thing with the FIT test is just to have follow the directions well in terms of what you're supposed to eat and do uh, to make it as effective as possible. Uh, and then Cologuard's newer. It's been out now for uh, about six or seven years. Um, and again, it looks for blood and then also cancer DNA. <clears throat> and it needs a full stool sample. So it's a little bit different instead of the little smear on the card. Here you basically poop in a box and you mail it in uh, and then you get a result uh, mailed back to you. So when we look at uh, detection rates, so non-invasive assessment for cancer DNA and or blood in the stool, which would be a stool sample. Um, negative means nothing detected. Positive means it detected blood or and or, and or DNA. Um, and here are our results. So colonoscopy, we detect most, if not all, large precancerous polyps. These are those big adenomas that you worry are going to progress to cancer. Uh, Cologuard detects about 35 to 40 percent of them. And then FIT test, which is just the blood, not looking for cancer DNA, drops to about 25 percent. Uh, so th the challenge with these tests is uh, you're not picking up the, really the most important polyps that are out there, which are the ones that are likely to progress to colon cancer. This is kind of another way of looking at some of this data. So um, finds colon cancer. So this is, will the test be positive and detect a colon cancer that's in you. Uh, the FIT fecal DNA, that's the Cologuard, so it's testing for blood and cancer DNA, about 92% chance. It does detect most um, colon cancers. FIT testing, so that's just the blood test, 75 to 85%. And then colonoscopy, rarely we won't see one, but it's about 95% or a little higher. 
finds high-risk polyps. Again, those are those high-risk polyps that we don't want to miss. Cologuard, about 42%. Fit testing, pretty close, but 30 to 40%. And then colonoscopy, again, greater than 95%. And then false positives. Um, you know, the fit testing is listed here as less than 4%. My experience has been it's a bit higher than that. Uh, and then Cologuard, 12%. That can vary too, but certainly getting a false positive is not uncommon with these uh, stool-based tests that then subsequently send you for a colonoscopy and myself or one of my partners looks and says, it looks good, don't do that test again because it may come back positive and you'll be sent right back. Uh, and then in terms of this risk of missing cancers, about one in five with FIT, about one in 13 with the Cologuard. And then colonoscopy, what we mentioned here is what we call interval cancers, which is cancers that develop within the screening intervals that are recommended for colonoscopy. Uh, and so those are rare, but they can occur. <clears throat> and so when we look at this, um, again, you know, what we want to do is prevent development to colon cancer, but some test is always better than no test, and so early detection is still beneficial. Finding cancers at early stages really improves um, your life quite a bit, both in your likelihood of surviving and uh, what you have to go through to be cured. And so this is a picture of what we do with colonoscopy. We looked at this picture earlier of the colon. Uh, and you can see here, this is a scope that's inserted into the colon. That's the colonoscope, advanced up to the very top of the colon. And then literally, we are looking around with this camera, trying to find anything that looks abnormal on the walls of the colon, with the hope being that we're going to find and remove polyps or find a cancer if it's there. And here's an example. This is a colonoscopy. This is a snare. And so they've, through the um, a channel inside of the scope, we can put little devices down. It has a little wire loop here. You can put the wire around the polyp, and then you close the snare and cut underneath the polyp, and you can remove it. And that's generally the, the main way that we remove most polyps nowadays uh, with colonoscopy. Here's a picture of a CT colonography. This is generally not as well covered anymore by insurance and not gotten as often. Um, this is another way to look for uh, polyps and cancer in the colon. If it's positive, you do end up needing to have a colonoscopy. Um, the, the general downside to CT colonography is it involves a colon prep. So you've got to clean everything out so that the radiologist can see. Then you have to have air kind of blown up in your colon so that they can inflate it really well and have the polyps stick out. Uh, and then subsequently, they do a scan. Um, challenges with CT colonography, one is that to make it cost effective, they effectively ignore small polyps. And so the guidelines that are out there from the American College of Radiology say that you don't need to report any polyp under six millimeters. Uh, for us in GI, we like to remove little polyps. They're easier to remove. They're less risky to remove. That's kind of what we prefer in general from a risk perspective. So waiting until polyps grow over six millimeters is less than ideal. And they also include that polyps under a centimeter, you can do a follow-up CAT scan in three years, which again to us is, is kind of just waiting for that polyp to progress to something worse. Um, but it's an interesting uh, technique, and it does work in certain selected patients, uh, those that may have a difficult colonoscopy, uh, or for some reason in discussing with their doctor, this can be a good option. So looking at colonoscopy, um, which, as we discussed, is the most effective test we have to find colon cancer and then to prevent colon cancer and remove polyps, quality is really the key here. A good exam is the most effective way that you can prevent colon cancer. Uh, and so there's certain factors that can be controlled. One is this split dose prep. I get a lot of questions from patients. Why are you making me get up in the middle of the night to drink the second half of the prep? Uh, and it's not because we're mean, uh, although if you do an afternoon exam, you'll get out of that. You'll drink it in the morning. Um, but for morning exams, you've got to drink your second half of the prep really only a few hours before the exam. We have pictures down here. This is a really nice prep in the colon. We'd say it's excellent. We can see these walls really well if there's a polyp there. And remember, at the beginning, we looked at some of those really subtle polyps that don't stick out very much. We would hope to find it. Good prep, again, fairly good. This is a good exam. We can clear this area down here and probably get a good exam. And then we move into what we call fair and poor preps. And here, there's a lot left over in here. It's really not going to be a good exam. The scope, while it can do a lot, it cannot suck stool out of your colon. So it's got a little tiny channel. It can pull kind of really clear liquid and water out. Once you get thicker than that, it just gets clogged right away, essentially. And so we do a number of things. We do the split dose prep. That second half of the prep is really important because 
if you drink all the prep and you don't do anything for 12 hours, bile and other stuff are kind of coming down from your intestinal tract even though you're not eating. And you get mucus and kind of covering, it's like this kind of gunky stuff up at the top here that's hard to clear uh, and, and obscures our views. And so we have you drink the first half and then the second half you drink fairly close to the exam to do kind of a second wash and bring everything through. We have you drink a low residue or eat a low residue diet for a few days before the exam, so avoiding nuts and seeds and all these really healthy foods that also clog the scope and make it harder to see in there. Um, but they're otherwise really good for you. We're only doing that because we want to have a good quality exam. Uh, we want to avoid constipation before starting a prep. So you kind of think about your car, the dirtier it is when you go through your car wash, the less well cleaned it'll be if you're just running through kind of a rapid car wash. Uh, so trying to not be really backed up as you go to start your prep is great. You can always discuss that with us, your primary care doctor, your gastroenterologist, um, and then discussing any pre-existing issues so that we can make sure that we schedule you appropriately in terms of how to do sedation and that sort of thing. And reading the instructions carefully, ideally five to seven days beforehand. When you read them the night before, you kind of get surprised with the things you were and weren't supposed to do. So looking at colonoscopy and, and how it works in prevention, Again, most effective colon, colorectal cancer prevention test detects three times more of the advanced lesions than FIT, two times more of these advanced lesions that are likely to turn into cancer than the Cologuard, the FIT DNA. It's the only test that has diagnosis and resection. So we can go in, figure out what's going on, and do whatever it is we need to do with the scope at the same time. And it's the only test that you can do at 10-year intervals, which is advantageous. A normal colonoscopy indicates a much lower risk for colon cancer if you have no polyps and you were told to come back in 10 years and that's a nice 10 years that you're not gonna get pestered, that you didn't turn in your stool card, or your stool test or whatever. Um, looking at risks, you know, a lot of people kind of say, well, colonoscopy is great, but I don't know about these risks. So cardiopulmonary risks, so that's breathing or heart risks. You know, overall, the data that's out there is less than 1%. These are very rare. Um, those risks can go up as somebody's overall health declines and we always wanna make sure that your health is reasonably good. Um, before undergoing a colonoscopy. Uh, perforation risk, so that's kind of the main thing people worry about is I heard that you can put a hole in the colon and that could be a disaster. Uh, so that risk overall, 0.03 to 0.007%. Um, standard of care, you know, kind of within the um, literature is about one in 2,000 or 0.05%. Uh, I figured I'd put my data in here. Um, I've had two perforations in about 12 years of being in practice. I do somewhere around 1,000 colonoscopies per year. Um, what were those two perforations? Well, neither one of them was just looking in a colon and, and getting a good look. One was a perforation that was not related to screening. It was a high-risk situation where we knew it was going to be difficult. Um, and then one was a perforation that actually happened a few days later related to resection of a large polyp. And so these are risks we accept when we remove large polyps. Uh, again, smaller the polyp, the less the risk. As it gets larger, the more the benefit is of removing it, but the risk goes up too for complications. And generally, if you have a larger polyp, your doctor's gonna talk to you about that after the exam and say, I removed it, and these are the things to watch for, and this is what we need to do. But this is over the span of probably 12,000 colonoscopies. Bleeding after polyp removal, overall, half a percent. Uh, this is another thing that's very much associated with the size of a polyp. So, Every day we remove lots of small polyps. Small polyps under six or seven millimeters, very rare to bleed. As we get to around a centimeter, that's where we see more risk of bleeding. Um, and again, that depends on the type of polyp and how it's removed, um, but it can be up to about a three to 5% risk with large polyps. Death attributable colonoscopy that I could find in the literature, one in 15,000. Uh, and then I wanted to put some other odds of death to kind of compare. So motor vehicle collision, one in 100 in one lifetime. Uh, I think per year it's about one in 10,000. Uh, fall, one in 102 lifetime. Gun death, one in 221. Drowning, one in 1,000. So very small risk of death with colonoscopy. I can't quite say it's zero. I guess I haven't done 15,000 yet, but I hope to get through my career with no death during a screening colonoscopy. Um, what else do we do to make sure we do a high quality exam? So high definition colonoscope. These generally are, are most places would have these nowadays. This is any colonoscope manufactured probably in the last five years. Careful exam of the colon. So as we discussed, you put a light into the colon, you go up to the top with your camera, you look as you go out. Now you can just run to the top of the colon, pull the scope out and say, I'm done, I did a great job, I didn't see anything, but it's really spending time. 
Most of the studies that are out there say at least six minutes spent pulling the scope out, looking at the surfaces and the folds. Most gastroenterologists are closer to about 10 minutes. We really try to get a good look and see everything we can. Experienced endoscopists, greater than 95% cecal intubation rate. So that's how likely are we to be successful getting to the top of the colon and seeing it all. Adenoma detection rate, so lower limit, so this is kind of the minimum acceptable standard, greater than 20% in women, greater than 30% in men. U.S. average adenoma detection rate is about 39%, although this is increasing with time. My own personal metrics from the last year that we had recorded them, and they're trailing a little bit, so I don't have the last few months. Withdrawal time's 11.2 minutes. My adenoma detection rate in men is about 66%, and in women's about 62%. And my cecal intubation rate is very close to 100%. We couldn't get the exact number because sometimes we don't go all the way to the top if the prep's not good and other things like that. But overall, the expectation would be we're trying to find any polyps that are there. And you can see the polyps are not uncommon. You know, we used to think with the lower def scopes they weren't that common. Now we know they are fairly common, but most of the time small, easy to remove, not necessarily high risk. Uh, so I want to uh, just touch on something called GI genius. We're hearing about artificial intelligence, AI, all over the tech world, and this has actually come to gastroenterology. Um, we were the first practice in Colorado to incorporate GI genius and one of the first practices in the country. Uh, and so it significantly improves adenoma detection rate and cancer detection. It improves it about 13% in randomized controlled trials. Most of that's probably those adenomas and not necessarily that it helps find cancers, but it can. Uh, and you can see a picture of it here. So on our screen, it just circles things with these little boxes. Uh, and whenever it sees a little bump or tissue that it thinks is abnormal, there's a little circle on our screen. And sometimes it'll prompt us to go look at an area that maybe we hadn't noticed looked any different. And it does seem in both our own internal data uh, and randomized controlled trials and peer-reviewed studies to significantly increase the rate of polyp detection. Um, Less than 1% false activations, it circles a fair amount of stuff, so I don't know if it's less than 1%, but it does help a lot in terms of improving that rate. And you can see here that overall, uh, GI of the Rockies improved quite a bit uh, in terms of our adenoma detection rate over a year of, of incorporating GI Genius. So um, risk groups, so average risk. So we're gonna get into kind of how do you know what your risk is for colon cancer. So, no personal history of colon cancer, no family history of colon cancer. And then IBD is a separate issue, but always worth discussing with your doctor. Uh, that stands for inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. So if you have a history of those, we monitor you a little bit more closely. Uh, and then we start screening at age 45. In terms of when to stop, it really depends on overall health. So somewhere in the 75 to 85, generally we say we don't screen over age 85. Uh, at 75 is where we kind of have to look at what's your health, what's your expected lifespan based on the conditions you're dealing with, how easy was the colonoscopy. Um, and then there's different options for screening. As we've discussed, uh, there's the stool blood testing called FOBT or FIT is the newer test that has been out now for a while, but that's the main one used. The FIT DNA, so that's blood plus cancer DNA every three years, so it's less frequent um, and it's more expensive, but generally covered under your screening cost. Uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is not really done much, but in the past was done about every five years. CT colonography is that CAT scan of the colon that is recommended every five years. Uh, and then colonoscopy every 10 years uh, if it's normal. <clears throat> if done, uh, what we see is a decrease in colorectal cancer cases and deaths by 60 to 80% with good compliance with screening. So uh, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, that U.S. PTF, uh, in 2016 uh, recommended screening starting at age 50 and continuing till 75, individualized from 76 to 85. However, due to this increasing risk of colon cancer in younger patients, those guidelines have really been adjusted uh, through all of the different groups of recommend. Uh, uh, screening. And so you can see here basically now it's starting at age 45, led to about a 4 to 8 percent decrease in the number of new cancers and about a 10 percent decrease in colorectal cancer deaths, uh, with a 12 to 17 percent increase in the number of colonoscopies needed compared to starting at age 50. 
Uh, and so now, uh, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force is one of the more conservative guidelines, so it changes a little later than the others, but they've all come along to recommending screening at 45. So unfortunately, for most of us, 45 is the new 50. Uh, and then again, continuing to 75, and then risk assessing what is that patient's risk for colon cancer, depending on their family history and their history of polyps, uh, and additionally, uh, what's their overall health as they go from 76 to 85. Uh, and the American Cancer Society has also recommended screening at age 45. Uh, that the bill passed in Colorado uh, that was signed in 2020 um, basically requires insurance coverage for colorectal cancer screening at 45 years and older, um, given the recent changes in clinical guidelines. And so insurance companies are generally covering screening at 45 by any of these modalities. Uh, so looking at risk groups, Increased risk. So the big one is first degree relative. So if you have a relative who had colon cancer, or I would note additionally a higher risk polyp. So if they had a big polyp over a centimeter, sometimes they won't know that, but if they know they had to come back relatively soon in a couple years or three years, or their doctor said, I'm worried about it, or they had to have surgery for a polyp, we treat all of those like cancer, and then we would screen more frequently starting at age 40 or sometimes earlier generally 10 years earlier than they were diagnosed with their polyp or cancer. And then there's hereditary syndromes. We start quite a bit earlier there uh, and then generally do an annual or every other year colonoscopy. Uh, and so you can see here that risk for family history, it really just goes up with time. It's not like it goes up when you're young and then kind of levels out and you go back to normal. It stays higher than patients with no family history. Looking at family history of colon cancer. So most colon cancer is sporadic. What that means is it's just bad luck, not related to your family history or your genetics. Uh, and then there are some rare syndromes. And then what we see is this familial adenomatous polyposis that we'll talk about in a second, and Lynch syndrome, which is a, a frequent cause of colon cancer. And then this kind of familial group where we don't really know what exactly it was, and there's some other uncommon syndromes, uh, but they have a family history and they develop colon cancer. <clears throat> so Lynch syndrome, that's probably the most frequent one we encounter as adult gastroenterologists. It's autosomal dominant, so that means that you only need one parent to pass you the gene, so one parent has Lynch and they can pass it uh, to their children. It's about 3% of colon cancers. There's about a 50% risk of colon cancer over the lifespan of somebody with Lynch, although it does vary on the specific mutation. Early onset, although you can see not at age 18 or 20, it still takes place kind of coming into middle age and often is higher in the colon. That's proximal location, so in the right side, the top of the colon. And then there's other cancers associated with Lynch too that we sometimes will screen for. Uh, there is genetic testing for this, and it's known to be under-recognized. We miss most cases of Lynch. Most people do not know that they have this risk and do not get tested. And then screening works. We do an annual or sometimes every other year colonoscopy starting at a young age, about 25, uh, and often can detect and remove polyps in time. Uh, with Lynch syndrome, the cancers still come from polyps. It's just that the polyps advance very quickly uh, to cancers. Familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP, as adult gastroenterologists, we rarely encounter this. It's a rare syndrome. It is, again, passed down from one parent who has it to another, uh, to their child. It's essentially 100% risk for colon cancer. It's innumerable polyps. So this is the scope, this black thing. It's turned in a circle looking backwards, and there's just you know, probably 60 polyps just on this little picture. Uh, and so it's not even possible to remove them all. Uh, this is generally diagnosed in children. Uh, and they get screened regularly and often have to have their colon out at a fairly young age. So um, to summarize, colon cancer, uh, fourth most common cancer in the U.S., second most common cause of cancer death. The best screening test is the one that gets done. Uh, so certainly colonoscopy is the most effective screening test we have, both at detecting and then preventing colon cancer. But doing nothing is by far the worst choice. Uh, than saying, I don't want to do a colonoscopy. So doing some tests and recognizing if it's positive, you may need a colonoscopy is important. Uh, it is lethal. This is a cancer that is not one that is easy to treat and cure. And again, it's preventable, partly with lifestyle changes and then screening. Um, colonoscopy most effective and then other screening strategies or options too. Uh, I can't remember if I mentioned this, but with fam family risk, people who are at increased risk for, for colon cancer, 
Colonoscopy is really the only screening rec uh, method recommended. You can do the other methods. I don't think your insurance will stop you, um, but from a, a risk standpoint, the risk is high enough that you really want to have a colonoscopy. So again, age 45, only test recommended for positive family history. Every 10 years, if you don't have polyps, more frequently if you do, that depends on your doctor's recommendation. At uh, GI The Rockies, we follow guidelines that are out there, and generally that follow-ups five to seven years for adenomatous polyps, or sooner if there's a fair number of them or they're large or higher risk. Uh, and then talk to your doctor if you have a family history of colon or other cancers. And then again, FIT test yearly, that's the stool test for blood, or Cologuard every three years uh, if you're 45 or older or in that uh, earlier screening group. Um, notably, these do miss some cancers and they do miss most high-risk polyps. Uh, so that concludes the slide portion of the talk, and um, we'll see if there's any questions, and I can have Karen kind of relay them over. Thank you, Doctor. That was very informative. We do have some questions that have come in, and we do want to encourage our audience that now is the time that you can uh, put your questions in the chat box, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, these are in no particular order. We're just going to go through them. So, uh, this person is asking about age. They're on, on the cusp of the high end of age that you had put forward for receiving colonoscopies. They said that they're 74 years old and they've never had one. Um, the annual FITs have been negative. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would encourage you to do a colonoscopy. Um, I don't know when your last uh, fit test was, uh, but when it hits a year, we actually see the benefit of colonoscopy go up as you get older because the cancer risk goes up. Uh, so you potentially would be a one and done uh, coming in having a colonoscopy at 74 or 75. If you have no polyps, we'd probably send you on your way and say you're low risk, good job. Uh, if you do have polyps removed, you've, you've lowered that risk. And again, the risk for colon cancer only goes up the older we get. And so the main reason that we stop screening uh, is more related to other health risks and kind of looking out over that 10-year benefit. So that would assume that you're in fairly good health and as you look at it and your primary care doctor looks at it, you say, I'm looking out, I'm, I think I've got you know, eight, 10 plus years in me. And I would say, great, come on in and get checked. Okay, thank you. So uh, this person says, please remind me as a grandmother a direct relative. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. A, a grandmother, are they a direct relative? Uh, so yeah, a grandmother uh, would be a second degree relative. So most colon cancer risk is with first degree relatives. And so yeah, I didn't address that. So I apologize. But um, first degree is, is one removed. So mom, dad, brothers and sisters. Once you go up to two, so that would be grandparents, aunts and uncles. Uh, the risk really drops if you're not seeing anything in the first degree relatives. Uh, uh, and so then generally it's average risk screening if it was a grandparent, as long as your mom or dad or, or whoever was the, your parent who was the son or daughter of the grandparent uh, did not have high risk polyps at a relatively young age. Age 60 uh, or younger is generally what we're looking for in those relatives. So if the, um, the mom and dad have polyps, um, does that mean that the child, when they get 45, should start testing more or? Uh, yeah, so um, if, if your parents have polyps, uh, you know, we used to say if your parents had polyps, you just, you come in early and you're going to be every five years. Uh, the guidelines have kind of shifted. We're, we're finding polyps now. You saw the adenoma detection rates have really increased with better scopes and our ability to detect them. And so what we're really looking for is high-risk polyps. And the guidelines now say you want to know that it was high risk. A lot of people are like, I don't know. The, I talked to my mom, and they said they had a polyp, and they had to come back. What I use for that, probably the best way to guesstimate it is, did they have to come back sooner than five years? So five years is kind of the historically low risk polyp return rate. If they said, oh, yeah, when I had one when I was in my 50s, and they made me come back in three years or two years, that can indicate a little bit higher risk, and then you would want to come in and talk to your doctor about it and potentially get checked earlier. Um, and generally, that polyp risk is age 60 and below, or age 60 and above is where the risk is lower. So if mom or dad had polyps, they were higher risk, and they were in their 40s or 50s or younger, 
Um, it may be worth coming in at age 40 for a higher risk screening, uh, or age 45 if they just had kind of those run-of-the-mill smaller lower risk polyps. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, this person said they just had a sessile serrated mm -hmm. adenoma removed at age 45, yeah. and, and they have IBS. Is that a risk factor? Uh, so yeah, irritable bowel syndrome or IBS is not a risk factor for colon cancer or polyps. Uh, sessile serrated adenomas are a type of adenoma. We see them more in the right side, the top part of the colon. Some of those slides I showed earlier of polyps, the sessile serrated tend to be kind of the flat and a little bit more subtle polyps. Uh, and so they're increasingly recognized, though, as polyps that are important to detect and, and remove. Okay. Um, so you mentioned Cologuard in some of these similar tests. Uh, do those have to be prescribed? Uh, I believe they do. I guess I, I don't know for sure because I just haven't tried to just buy one. <laughs> um, so generally, I think your doctor would need to order it. Um, but I don't know for sure. Okay. You spoke to the sum, uh, but this person was asking again about how common is injury caused by colonoscopy. Okay, yeah, so uh, again, risk of perforation extremely low. I think I said about 1 in 15,000, and I think people can access the talk in the slides afterwards. Uh, that's the main injury that we worry about. Um, you know, I would say for a lot of people, it takes a day or two to totally go back to normal. You kind of cleared everything out, and we got to look in there. Um, so that injury is, again, extremely rare. Uh, cardiopulmonary issues, so breathing or heart-related issues are rare, but they can be seen. They're pretty rare with screening colonoscopy, something we see more in higher risk situations. Uh, and then always important to risk stratify. We have different options for how we do a colonoscopy, whether we can do it in the endoscopy center, which is a little bit of a lower risk, or if we need to go to the hospital to have more resources available for somebody who needs that. Okay. Does anal sex affect occurrence rate? Uh, it does not affect colon cancer occurrence rate. Uh, it is something to talk to your doctor about um, because there, there can be an increased risk for anal cancer. Uh, that's a cancer in the mucosa just in the anal canal. We sometimes will detect that with colonoscopy. It's a much less common cancer. Generally, colonoscopy is not screening for it, although if we see something there, we usually get a good look. We look for hemorrhoids. We look for other abnormalities in the anal canal and in the rectum. Uh, but uh, yeah, anal cancer, increased risk, but that's a different cancer from colon and rectal cancer. OK. Um, can you talk about the sedation method? Uh, yeah, so uh, most people prefer sedation, and maybe it'll be a good thing for us to put in the talk in the future. Um, there's different options with colonoscopy. It is uncomfortable. It is a scope that's, you know, pushing up through the colon, and there's air inflating you, so there's kind of a gas discomfort, and then more of a deep-seated discomfort as the scope goes up. As the scope comes out, it's not really painful at all. Um, for many people, what we call conscious sedation works well. Conscious sedation is usually an anxiolytic, so we usually use Versed, which is kind of like Xanax or Valium, uh, and then a narcotic, which usually we'll use fentanyl with colonoscopy. It's short acting, and we can give small titrated doses to monitor somebody. For most people, the combination of those, generally you take a nap, you wake up afterwards and don't remember. Sometimes people are a bit awake, and then we're really focused on how comfortable are you. If you're awake and you're comfortable and you want to watch on the screen, you can do that. If you're awake and not super comfortable, we give you more meds and get you sleepy again. So conscious sedation generally refers to the fact that you're arousable. We can kind of tap you on the shoulder and wake you up, but fairly out of it. Uh, one step beyond that uh, would be anesthesia-directed sedation or propofol, um, and we do both of these in our practice. So we do a mix of conscious and propofol depending on what somebody needs as long as we plan for it in advance. Propofol is a deeper level of sedation, so you have to be monitored more closely by an anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist uh, and observed more closely, but you're also deeper to sleep. And so you are very much out of it. You will not know what went on, and you will wake up and say, are you done yet? Uh, sometimes that's with conscious sedation, and sometimes people are, are kind of in and out. Does insurance cover either one? Uh, insurance generally does cover it. Either one, it's, it's insurance dependent and indication dependent. So some insurances 
have a whole host of indications to get a little bit more sedation or what we call propofol, uh, and some are a little bit more restrictive. Uh, although one indication is that you have significant anxiety about the procedure. So if you're somebody who's like, I really need to be asleep, I do not want to be a touch awake, even if I'm comfortable, you'd probably qualify for propofol based on that alone. Um, if colon cancer risk is on the rise starting at age 20, why is the recommended screening age still high, like 45 rather than closer to 30? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, most of that increased risk is in that 45 to 50 age group. And so I didn't have a slide that was breaking out kind of the 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 and 40 to 50. It's, it's on the rise, but when you look at the, particularly um, people under the age of 40, the risk is very small. And so then you get into such a small risk that you don't necessarily have the same risk benefit analysis that results in a net benefit. Even with really small risks with colonoscopy, um, it's hard to be beneficial if the colon cancer risks are extremely small in that age group. I think the 40 to 45 is an area that, that you could make an argument either way. Currently, the guidelines say 45 and over is where we start, uh, and so that's where we start average risk screening. Okay. Is there a relationship between diverticulitis and colon cancer? Uh, yeah, good question. No, there's not. Uh, so I didn't have this in the, in the talk, but diverticulosis is a very common finding during colonoscopy. Uh, and I don't have a picture, unfortunately, to show you, but it, you can look on the internet, too. It's little pockets that form in the colon. Diverticulitis is when those pockets get infected, and then you usually will have pretty significant pain, fevers and chills, you'll know something's wrong. Most diverticulitis is on the left side in the sigmoid colon. Most diverticulosis is there, too, which is the presence of those pockets. We see those in probably half or more of patients undergoing a screening colonoscopy. But again, no association with colon cancer, kind of a separate issue. Most people with diverticulosis, the pockets will never get diverticulitis. Two main things we know associated with it, high red meat intake, and that's associated with diverticulitis. High red meat intake, and then lots of use of NSAIDs like ibuprofen and Aleve and Advil. Uh, so if you have diverticulosis and want to lower your risk for diverticulitis, Limiting your red meat, limiting NSAID use are probably the two biggest things you can do. Oh, and then I should say, do not worry about avoiding popcorn, nuts, seeds, berries. We used to say that as doctors many years ago, and it's still kind of out there, but it has been disproven uh, very effectively in a number of studies. So nuts, seeds, berries, popcorn, they're all good for you. Enjoy them. Your colon likes fiber. Your diverticulosis likes fiber, too. Okay, perfect. Um, we'll try to squeeze in a few more questions right. here. Uh, before we wrap it up. Why are the genetics tests not showing colon cancer uh, genes in family members with colon cancer? A high-risk family, mom died at 36. Uh, I, I guess I don't know this person's specific situation, um, but uh, there's two things to keep in mind. One, you know, the pace of research is kind of slow and steady and spurts and starts. And so we know a number of genes that are associated with colon cancer, we have a name for some of these syndromes, uh, but they are not all known yet. And so in somebody whose mom had colon cancer at 36, uh, the two things I would generally recommend would be discussion with your primary care doctor, potentially a discussion with a genetic counselor, and you can find one just literally typing into Google, find a genetic counselor, and they do telemed visits generally to see if you'd benefit from testing. And then colonoscopy in that case would start 10 years earlier, so age 26. And depending on genetic testing results, it would be every five years, or if you were to be positive for one of these syndromes we know of, uh, potentially sooner. So the genetic testing is not done through your office? Uh, no, we would refer you to a genetic counselor, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, when you have polyps removed, uh, is it uh, more likely that they could regenerate in the same place they were removed? And is scar tissue an issue? Uh, so, yeah, good questions. Uh, scar tissue is generally not an issue at all from your standpoint as the patient. You know, we can see the scar in there, and I've never had anybody that I have any suspicion the scar is bothering them. Uh, it would be just like a little scar on your forearm or something like that. Uh, in terms of removing polyps, so small polyps generally are easier to completely remove, 
and we don't really have a lot of concerns with small polyps. We generally will put the little snare around it and cut the polyp with some normal tissue off. And it's kind of like nicking yourself, shaving, or just a little bit of scratch on your elbow. That mucosal layer is, is basically very thin and tolerant of, of having, having a piece of it removed. Uh, with large polyps, there is more risk. So with a large complex polyp, if we have to remove it in multiple pieces, what we call piecemeal, there is a risk of it coming back, and generally your doctor is going to tell you to come back sooner. So we may say we need to look again in six months or a year and make sure that none of that polyp is growing back. And that's something we would usually talk to you about after the exam. Does it matter which part of the colon a polyp is found? Uh, in general, it doesn't. I mean, different types of polyps can affect different parts of the colon, uh, but it doesn't, there's not an increased risk because it's on the right versus the left. It's mostly that we were not as good in the past at detecting polyps in the right colon, and therefore we're not as good at preventing colon cancer in the right colon versus the left. With high def scopes, with artificial intelligence like GI Genius, uh, it's really improved a lot, and I think over the next 10 years what we'll see is decreasing rates of colon cancers, including on the right side, and we've already seen some of that. Okay.